Hello, Working Preachers. This is Joy J. Moore. Our fall campaign is in full swing, but we still need your help to reach our goal before November 30th. We're celebrating Working Preacher as a community of imagination this week. I'm grateful for writers, actors, musicians, and well, those people who allow me to pretend that I am one of those persons. I've appreciated the patterns of being able to be creative, whether trying to repeat what I've seen in art or trying to describe with words the awesomeness of what it means to experience God and put it in words. Those people in my life are the kinds of people that make me the preacher I am. You can make your gift to the fall campaign in honor or memory of someone who supports you in your faith journey. I can't wait to see who you honor with your generosity to Working Preacher. And thank you to every one of you who have given so generously already. You can go to workingpreacher.org today to make your gift. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. I'm Joy J. Moore. And this is the podcast for November 26th, 2023. And the texts uh, come from 2 Kings 22 and 2 Kings 23. And it's the story of Josiah's Reformation. Um, the story goes like this, that after Isaiah's, uh, at the end of Isaiah's life, um, who probably died around 690, uh, there then arose the longest reigning king in the history of the Southern Kingdom, who also turned out uh, Manasseh to be, according to King, Second Kings, the worst king, the most worst unfaithful king. king. Put, put, he put at least one son to death in child sacrifice, according to the kings. He also allowed the Assyrian um, uh, religion to be established in Jerusalem. And then uh, when he was finally replaced, it, uh, it kind of goes for, uh, it's the pendulum swing. Josiah uh, is, uh, becomes a, a, the good king, and he, he cares about the temple that's uh, been allowed to fall into disrepair. So in his 18th year as king, uh, 622 uh, BCE, he, he, sends, he, he says, uh, basically, fix up the temple. I don't care how much it costs. Whatever it costs, I'll pay the bill. And then they come to him and they go, we, we found this scroll in the temple. And the scroll we think that was found is the core of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, you know, it's the scroll of the law of the, law of the Lord. Um, and we don't know whether it had been hidden by uh, the the priests and the scribes there from Manasseh, or maybe literally it had just been found. Uh, uh, but it's, then they read it to the king and he said, we haven't been doing any of these things. We have not been following the law. And he inaugurates a, a, an important thing. He then consults with the prophet Hulda, uh, uh, one of the women prophets of the Old Testament. And I think it's important uh, to note that. I think uh, in our verses, we inadvertently, we should have read a little further. We were concerned about length, but that goes a few verses longer. And um, Hulda basically blesses uh, the Reformation. And so a great reform is put uh, into place. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to second that it's important to note uh, Holda. So, um, yeah, maybe read a few of those verses that are in brackets. Because Holda says in verse 15, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me, thus says the Lord, right? Thus says the Lord. Uh, we don't hear a woman saying that very often in the Old Testament. <laughs> so it's worth lifting that up, uh, I think, in this story. Go ahead, Absolutely. Uh, no, I, I appreciate I appreciate that. Um, I also think it's worth noting because one of the things that happens um, um, across Israel's history as we read the full of the story is that a generation grows up that did not know the things that God has done. We've, we've heard that in a variety of ways. And uh, in this particular case, um, Manasseh had been um, the king for so long. Josiah is, is just a child. 
He's eight years old when he is uh, made king. And um, so while he hasn't heard of all of these things, which he's amazed at, he also hasn't been so corrupted under the leadership of the previous king. And so there was still hope. And uh, I think that that's something that folks might want to lean into uh, as they uh, look at this text, that um, um, we don't want to look at the, the younger generation always as saying, you know, well, there's, there's no hope if it's in them. Uh, that might exactly be the hope for them to find that somebody before them actually had the right idea. It's just that nobody ever enacted it. We don't have to create the brand. We don't have to make the wheel all over again. And one has been made, we just have to use it. Uh, and in this particular case, I think that is the very story of what it means for us to read this ancient text, is to realize that the good we desire, um, that the expectations of what it means to be the called out community of faith has been um, has been literally spelled out for us and is in need of a community to put it into practice. And we may note that like Manasseh, our, our kings and our leaders, or as we saw, uh, as we will see in the New Testament, uh, the leaders of the church, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, the lawmakers, are not always the ones that are going to be faithful. Um, the ones that we should follow that will really reform us are those who will be faithful to God's word alone. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Uh, I want to tie this into the uh, the church year for those uh, people who follow the church year. This is Christ the King Sunday. It marks the end of the church year. And this is a really fitting text for that, yeah. that you've got here. You've got a story about a king who actually is one of the few faithful kings as the as uh, the first and second kings and Samuel narrate uh, the the history of kingship in Israel, and and this book that they find and bring to the king um, is you go back to October eighth. The it's the core of the book of Deuteronomy that the first thing that happens then is the Ten Commandments, and it would be fun to act this out in worship, which is you know uh, have somebody have 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 the um, the custodian of the church or the librarian come running in. Hey, hey, we found this book. We think you might be interested in it because we've noticed nobody has been following these rules. Thou shalt, help, thou shalt have no other gods. Thou shalt not kill, right? Uh, you could have a little fun with it that way. And also notice the relationship between king and religion is proper here. Going back to the way David uh, would work either with um, Sam, uh, not Samuel, David would work with uh, Nathan. 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 There's a couple prophets that work with David, um, but okay, I guess it's Samuel. Samuel. Samuel anoints him, right? And uh, Samuel anoints him. I thought it was Samuel. Yeah, it is. I, I was okay. All right. So here's the point, though. Right? It's is during these intervening years, like we had the story with Elijah. The prophet is not welcome. He's hunted down. Uh, they don't. So it's. It's the proper role when uh, the king actually accepts the direction and accepts the uh, the scolding, the the critique, but also seeks permission from uh, the prophet. And of course, here the prophet is the prophetess Hulda. Yeah, I really I, appreciate yeah. that noting uh, of uh, that it is both the scolding and criticism that is received as well as the affirmation and permission. You, you inter I interrupted no, you. No, no, that. that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, we often think about a prophet as speaking truth to power, and that is the case for a lot of the prophets in a lot of circumstances. But uh, in yeah, the prophet also gives direction and, and affirms and supports the king when the king is doing what he should do. I, I just wanted to note that... Um, there was a, a, a very short-lived reign uh, uh, of a king right before Josiah. Yeah. Josiah's, so Manasseh is Josiah's grandfather. His father, mm -hmm. Amon, uh, only rules for two years before he's assassinated by his own servants. Uh, and Josiah, so as you said, Joy, Josiah is eight years old when he begins to reign. Uh, his, it, 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 he, he, this, he, he, finds the book of the law or his servants find the book of the law uh, in his 18th year. So he's 26. And you have to, you have to wonder whether he, 
someone taught him, right? Like I'm thinking of, if this is the core of the book of Deuteronomy, right? We think about Deuteronomy 6, you know, you shall teach these laws to your children when you sit down and when you rise, you know, when you uh, go on your way, you know, in your household. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on Deuteronomy about teaching God's Torah, God's law, God's instruction to the next generation. So uh, you, you might wonder, you know, maybe it's Josiah's mother, maybe it's a, a tutor or a prophet or something uh, who who trains him up in the way that he should go. And he, he lives that out then when he becomes king uh, or when he's 26, at least. I, and I'm reminded in Deuteronomy 2, so there's a there's the law of the king in Deuteronomy 17. And part of it is, you know, uh, when you when you want a king, you know, the king can't go back to Egypt to acquire horses because horses are for conquest, for war. Uh, it has to be someone from your own people. Uh, uh, the king shouldn't acquire many wives for himself. Um, but here's here's the pertinent verse. So this is Deuteronomy 17, 18. When he has taken the throne of his kingdom, he shall have a copy of this law written for him in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall remain with him and he shall read in it all the days of his life so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, diligently observing all the words of this law and these statutes, uh, not turning aside from the commandment either to the right or the left, so that he and his descendants may reign long over his kingdom in Israel. So, uh, the king, unlike the neighboring nations, right, where kings are despots or kings are, um, you know, um, are all powerful, that's not to be the case for kingship in Israel. Uh, the king is to be subject to God's law, just as uh, just as the people are. And the king, in fact, is supposed to lead the people in obeying that law and in learning that law, which is exactly what Josiah does in this religious reform when he uh, when he has the words of this Torah. Uh, read to all the people. So he is a he is a model king, uh, and and an appropriate text, an appropriate figure to talk about on Christ the King Sunday. Though of course you also want to move to Christ the King, right? On Christ the King Sunday and talk about uh, Jesus uh, as King. Jesus as a king, uh, even greater than Josiah, obviously one who uh, embodies the law, embodies the teaching of of God, and establishes a new covenant with the people. So from a, from a Reformation uh, to the New Covenant, um, if, if I may, the, the um, finding of a document is uh, some of the work that I've been uh, involved in um, these last few years, um, a um, journal from an abolitionist, from 19th century abolitionist, was um, just found um, in uh, uh, among the things in the alumni office uh, at, at 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 a college in Michigan, and um, one of my uh, colleagues um, was the chaplain there at the time, and um, there was this recognition that this little handwritten notebook was actually an authentic 19th century journal um, that had never seen been seen. We don't know, you know, how it wound up, where it did, and but no one knew it existed. Um, and uh, in the spring, a translate uh, a uh, writing of that will be will be available. But what's really exciting is what that finding that did was to take what we already knew about the abolition movement. Uh, this is a, a Wesleyan a Methodist um, um, a pastor, um, so uh, a Methodist abolitionist work in the 19th century. We were cognizant of it. But um, we're now engaged in that work in a dialogue on race and faith in the 21st century. And it's not that we didn't know, as you were describing, Catherine, but it was almost like finding it and putting our hands on it and knowing that someone before us had been engaged in this work. And here's their corner of their life that tells us about it became the charge we needed to say, how could we do that for us? And Oh, how much greater that it would be not finding someone's memoir or someone's, you know, journal, but to literally find an actual piece of, you know, the scrolls that record the law of God. If we could have that kind of energy and uh, enthusiasm um, as we enter into what will now be the season of Advent. Just think of how exciting Christmas will be.